defense noted. The 2012 film Dread, directed by Pete Travis, was way grittier and more realistic take on Judge Dread compared to his 1995 predecessor starring Sylvester Stallone. Although it received favorable reviews from critics, the movie struggled to make a significant impact at the box office. However, it found a second life as a cult classic among dedicated fans of the character. Meanwhile, the comic sequels inspired by the Dread movie have taken the dystopian world of mega City 1 to new heights. These comics provide readers with some seriously compelling as well as horrifying stories that delve deeper into the lives of characters like Judge Death and Judge Anderson. From high-stakes showdowns with dangerous drug lords to origin stories of iconic figures like Judge Death, these comic adaptations have a lot to offer. In this video, we will explore a few of the most exhilarating storylines that serve as a sequel to the Judge Dredd movies. So, without further ado, let's begin. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Incendiary. Dread Story in the Movies In my attempt to bring you up to speed with Dread's universe, I will quickly explore Judge Dread's story in the last Dread movie. If you remember the storyline, you can just skip to the next part. So yes, the Italian stallion is the OG Dread, but since his movie was not the last one of the franchise, Dread's story takes place after the events of Carl Urban's starer Dread. So in the third millennium, Earth has gone down the train in a pretty serious fashion. Most folks are crammed into incredibly large super cities, and the justice system has given way to the street judges, who serve as the judge, jury, and sometimes executioners. So, as you can understand, the judges have a lot of power and authority on the streets. One of the no-nonsense heavyweights in this crime and corruption-filled world is Judge Dredd from Mega City 1, the city that belongs to our man, Mr. Dredd. We recently did a video exploring everything there is to explore about Mega City 1. I'll leave a link in the description. At the end of the Sylvester Stallone movie, Judge Dredd was asked to become the Chief Justice, but he refused and continued to remain a street judge. Now, the Carl Urban reboot film took a very different approach. On a regular day on the job, Judge Dredd is assigned to train and evaluate Cassandra Anderson, a rookie judge with psychic powers. Their job takes them to Peach Trees Block, a crime-infested 200-story vertical slum controlled by the ruthless drug lord Mama and her gang. Here, they stumble upon a triple homicide. As a warning to others, three drug dealers were skinned alive and thrown down the atrium. Things get messy when Mama realizes one of her men, Kay, might spill the beans, so she locks down the entire building, turning it into a deadly battleground. As Mama puts a bounty on the judges' heads, they become targets for every criminal on the block. The psychic judge, or side judge Anderson, learns that Mama is manufacturing slow-mo, a drug gaining control of the city. As good be very well expected of him, Dread battles his way to Mama, leaving a trail of dead bad guys in his way. Mama, desperate to protect her empire, calls in corrupt judge Lex, Alvarez, Chan and Kaplan. Of course, he defeats them, albeit with a little help from Anderson. Dredd and Anderson then make their way to Mama's penthouse, where Dredd forces her to inhale slow-mo, a kind of poetic justice here. In the aftermath, a batter Dredd and Anderson exit the block. Anderson, who lost her primary weapon, gives her badge to Dredd as she believes she failed her evaluation. However, she is later seen leaving the judge headquarters with her gear, showing she is still a judge. And that's where the comics take over. Excited yet? Judge Dredd, Underbelly. This official comic tie-in featuring Judge Dredd and Judge Anderson picks up where the film left off. Mama's demise creates a power vacuum in Mega City 1, shaking things up big time. With the slow-mo empire crumbled, other criminal gangs jump in to fill the void in the narcotics market. One particularly nasty drug, described as making slow-mo look like candy, hits the streets, leading to the rise of a new female drug lord. 
So the comic begins in the cursed Earth region, the vast semi-arid pastures of land inhabited by mutants, people who could not find refuge in Mega City 1 or any of its sister cities. Naturally, they were left to fend for themselves in this irradiated land, which also transformed their DNA in the worst possible manner. You could say that the mutants were heavily discriminated against by the people from Mega City 1 and formed a persecuted group of people. Naturally, these mutants cast out of the cities for their sins of their genes always wanted to enter Mega City 1, where they hoped to find work and a new life amongst the city's gleaming towers. Some some wanted to send money home to their families and some had just enough to fend off predators in a radioactive desert. So they would often pay traffickers from Mega City 1 to get them inside. One such batch of smuggled mutants reached their destination by hiding in the back of a truck. But unfortunately, Mega City 1 had its own kind of predators. You see, 26 heinous crimes took place in the city every minute and despite the army of judges, criminals reigned over multiple pockets. The mutants were brought to a gang of criminals who wanted to send the mutants into several different professions. In fact, they proposed that one of the women be sent to Sector 9, Mega City 1's notorious red light area. However, a small group of judges busted the whole thing. Both sides opened fire and some of the bad guys lost their sorry lives. As far as the mutants were concerned, Judge Wilson wanted to throw them back to where they came from. However, the woman I was talking about earlier spoke up. Please, I need to find my son. He ran away and paid these men to take him to the city to make his fortune. Wilson said that he may be as good as dead if he was found by the men the judges had ambushed. However, the woman claimed that she could sense that he was still alive. Apparently, she could feel things. Wilson wanted to shut her up, but Psy Judge Anderson asked him to let her speak. Meanwhile, Judge Dredd was fighting another battle, but here he was a lone warrior. He was up against a group of heavily armed bank robbers, and backup was nowhere close. But of course, Dredd commanded his gun, Lawgiver, to open rapid fire, and within a few seconds, the robbers were dead. Once he had done his part, he was called to the Hall of Justice, the headquarters of street judges, where the Chief Justice was waiting for Dredd. Here, the Chief Justice briefed the judges about a critical, evolving situation. At 0600 hours yesterday, maintenance workers partially drained a pit of radioactive sludge near the west wall. Work was halted when they found the remains of the body. We've drained the rest and found over two dozen more. Of course, this was a dumping ground for corpses, and the deaths were anything but natural. All of the dead persons were mutants, and most of them died because of blunt force trauma to the head. It is now the that we meet a new and uprising drug dealer, another woman, who was on her way to become the next mama of Mega City 1. Somewhere else, judges attacked another criminal hideout, but when the judges retaliated to firepower with firepower, the leader of the criminals made a run for it with a bag that he held closer to his heart. Dredd managed to take him down, and upon investigation, he found that the bag was filled with a new drug called Psyche, which was the drug that I had earlier spoken about. Dredd remembered that Psyche was the key that linked the mutant trafficking and the rat pit corpse. Dredd had handcuffed him, but he managed to escape from Dredd's righteous clutches and later died without Dredd getting the opportunity to question him. But that did not mean that they could not extract information still. Psy Judge Anderson used her skills to learn the exact location of the base of operation of this new mistress of drugs. It turned out that the mutants were a short-term labor force. They were brought from the traffickers and forced to work making psych until the fumes and other deadly conditions killed them. The bodies were then dumped in the pits. When the judges ambushed the facility, it was nothing short of chaos. Judge Dredd found the woman, her chief scientist, and the kid of the mutant woman from before in the lab where the drug's secret ingredient was extracted. The woman attacked Dredd, sticking a knife in his gut, which momentarily incapacitated capacitated Dredd, but he managed to strike her down. It was revealed that Psyche's X-Factor was actually the addiction of a psychic's brain. You see, the young boy was also a psychic, like his mother. Judge Dredd was in a fix. He could not shoot the evil doctor because of a knife that the doctor had held to the child's neck. 
However, the kid happened to touch one of the chairs and felt the immense amount of pain that the chair had experienced. He then used his abilities to force the doctor to feel the pain of all the people he had killed, which killed the doctor. In the end, psych production was brought to a halt. Those behind it were either killed or imprisoned, and 78 people were to be thrown out into the cursed earth. While Judge Dredd called it justice, Sai Judge Anderson, if it really was justice to show innocence the door, innocence like the psychic mother-son duo who could add value to the society. And that's where the comic ends, but not this story. Dredd Uprise In Dredd Uprise issue 1, a 30-page comic by Rebellion, the story takes a different path from the film's narrative. Instead of focusing solely on Judge Dredd and Cassandra Anderson battling local criminals, it widens its scope to portray the entire Justice Department dealing with what initially seemed to be the workings of a well-organized crime syndicate known as Uprise. Interestingly, Judge Dredd isn't the central character for a significant portion of the story. He mainly serves to drive the main plot forward. It's only when he teams up with disgraced rookie street judge Conti to investigate a suspected sniper in the old Richardson building that we see Dredd in his classic no-nonsense and dry-humoured style. The British writer Arthur Wyatt takes a drip-feed approach, offering readers a series of short one- or two-page scenes that introduce a variety of different characters. This rapid introduction of characters might be a lot to take in for those new to the world of Mega City 1. One character of note is Judge Darrell, an aging judge who may have hung on to the job past his prime. He is depicted as a portly, double-chinned figure who is as violent as he is vindictive. Predictably, he is revealed to be the corrupt link in the chain of events that concludes the first part of Dread, a prize. In Dread, a prize, issue 2, you might initially get the sense of a somewhat disappointing conclusion when you first dive into it. However, this feeling of an abrupt ending is likely because the main story has fewer pages than its predecessor. To compensate for this, Rebellion includes a bonus Judge Dredd story by Rob Williams and R. M. Guerra, making the total length of the publication 50 pages. Anyway, Arthur White's writing kicks the story into high gear. We get a satisfying revelation about Judge Darrell being the Justice Department traitor. Joseph Dredd once again becomes the central character of the story, mentally revisiting the events of of the past days and he comes to the realization that rookie Judge Conti is, in fact, a competent and level-headed judge. There is a twist as we discover that the shadowy citizen Wallace is actually an undercover street judge. And before you know it, John Wagner and Carlos Esquera's co-creation is back in action, battling rogue robots and speeding through flaming sewers packed with more of these murderous machines. One slightly frustrating aspect is the absence of a face-off between Mega City One's most feared street judge and the portly conspirator Daryl. But Daryl meets his end at the hands of his rookie, Conti, which serves as a somewhat satisfying alternative. What might leave you hanging is the involvement of the the chief judge behind the entire uprising. The story concludes with Dredd retelling a recovering Wallace that she is promising an investigation at the highest level. This leaves the door wide open for potential future tales of corruption at the highest levels of the Justice Department, as the comic was advertised as an ongoing comic book sequel. The artwork in this magazine by Davidson is well-crafted and polished. Davidson's portrayal of judge uniforms closely resembles their big screen counterparts, and his cityscapes are impressively detailed and expansive. The credit for the rich visual appeal also goes to Chris Blythe, who handled the colors. Blythe's work gives the comic a gritty atmosphere, with subtle touches of red or green strategically used to enhance the overall look. Dread Dust. 800 million people huddled up against the habitable coastline of what once was North America is now a crowded mess of crime and corruption choking on itself. And beyond this cursed megacity lies a cursed earth, blasted rock and dust, from where arise the storms that sweep across the cursed thousands of kilometers. Winds up to a hundred miles an hour 
passed over vast stretches of bone-dry ground, lifting particles of contaminated dirt into the air until they form a curtain of swirling black silt filling the sky. As the storm hits, the city locks itself down, and even those not inside the hardened confines of the mega blocks seek to seal themselves in as best as possible. Those caught outside find cover or face a horrible death choking on the filth as the storm sucks the oxygen from the air. The comic brings its focus to the Otomo Plaza, where the dust from the storm was flying in. The maintenance staff Brinkley was looking for jammed access ports or any such openings when he noticed something shocking. We meet Judge Conti from the previous comic here. Judge Dredd and Conti leave for Otomo Plaza to look for the multiple homicides that Brinkley had found. It looked like the victim got off a burst from a head cannon, 12mm slug thrower. Anyway, the crime scene was a slaughterhouse, but one with a lot of cash lying around and a lot more guns. The primary reason could have been pharmaceutical grade narcotics, or that was Judge Dredd's first guess. But if it was the work of a rival gang, it was unusual to leave the money and the product behind. It was now that Dredd noticed the dust. The female staff of the building informs Dredd that the recent storm had messed up the ventilation system. However, they find another body who had been killed slowly by someone. It looked more like deep-rooted revenge than an act done to get money or power. This one was personal. Additionally, the man's eyes were missing. It seemed the judges had a vigilante on their hands, someone who was going after the bad guys. The doctor who performed the autopsy for the judges revealed several fascinating details. So, the special victim was Herbert Lopez, someone who had spent a lot of time in the cursed earth. He was older than the rest and hadn't done the same time in prison as the rest, but he still had a record. In fact, he was recently involved in the drugs trade and before that, his name had come up in cursed earth smuggling. They also found a known associate of Herbert, Elaine Gertrude, but she refused to know him very well. But they found another lead. A rad wagon bound for the city stopped checking in two days ago. Just before the storm, it was found apparently abandoned. When they got in, they found the crew and passengers dead, some from knife wounds, some choked to death, and nobody had seen anything like it. They thought maybe the raiders had struck then sealed the hatches after themselves. However, Judge Conti checked the names of the victims against the passenger lists. She was looking for anyone that Gertrude and Lopez may have traveled with, and she found Dalton Westlake, another man who had been killed in a slow and painful manner. They wanted to go back to Gertrude to ask about Westlake, but knew that she wouldn't talk. So they released the woman to see where she went first. After her release, she used a payphone to make several calls, one of which was for Westlake. Gertrude was clearly afraid of something. You see, Lopez was dead and she wasn't able to contact Westlake. But what was she hiding? Following her, the judges somehow managed to come face to face with the vigilante. He was in the process of making another fresh kill when the judges opened fire. However, this was no ordinary vigilante. This one could have had some kind of an ability that allowed him to control dust. You could say that he was something like Marvel's Sandman. There was a short scuffle, and although the vigilante turned to dust and disappeared, the judges found a live victim, but he did not survive for long. This one was Adolphus Carter. He used to run with various cursed earth gangs, overlapping with the profile of the other victims. Meanwhile, Dredd learns that the vigilante has escaped into cursed earth, so as would be expected, Dredd follows. Judges Conti, Ziger, and Dredd. They first visit the rad wagon where Westlake was found, but scavengers had left it empty, and all that remained inside were strange mutated creatures. Dredd and Conti notice someone staring at them, so they approach her. The old lady claims that she should not be so close to the canyons as the dust devils reside in the canyons. Well, we are getting somewhere. But they could not wait for more questions as the storm was rising again. So Conti and Dredd returned to their ship. But by now, they had another lead, a man named Michael C. Wolanski. The judges leave to find Michael, but find Judge Shanahan, a veteran judge who takes him to Michael. Michael had come there for protection and began narrating his encounter with a so-called dust demon. He was on a mission with Sheng and Westlake. They had received information about a cache of pre-war goods, but found nothing and were returning to the nearest town. As they made their way, they begin to feel as if something 
something was following them. They couldn't clearly see this entity, only catching glimpses of movement among the rocks. It seemed to be of human size, tracking them. Sheng, growing increasingly disturbed, started firing her weapon randomly in an attempt to hit whatever was pursuing them. However, at that moment, the entity made its move and attacked Sheng. Michael recalls the intense hatred radiating from this entity. Then, in a swirl of dust, it disappeared, leaving no trace of Sheng. The next day, Sheng's body was discovered just outside the town. This incident made it clear that the entity wasn't random. It knew them, and their past was catching up with them. Michael decided to take a job in Williamsburg in an attempt to escape this entity's pursuit. He also reveals that Sheng was connected to something that happened at New Barnevelt, where they were all present right now. It was now Shanahan's turn to tell the tale of New Barnevelt. New Barnevelt was founded by people primarily from Mega City One, seeking a new life outside the city's walls with the hope of living free from crime and oppression. The Vars were a prominent family in town as they brought their wealth from the city, including supplies like feedstock, water purifiers and energy cells, which they initially shared generously. Many in New Barnevelt were religious, much like the Vars. The town was expected to be a paradise until things took a turn. The Vars stopped being generous with their gifts and began hoarding supplies, which caused discontent among the town's residents. When the crops failed and supplies dwindled, it became evident that going it alone wouldn't be as easy as they thought. The Vars faced their own troubles, particularly with their son, Noel, who had some undisclosed issues. The situation escalated and strict rules against the mutants in New Barnevelt complicated matters further. The Vars eventually left town, but the issue of supplies remained. New Barnevelt was left without food, functioning water purifiers or power. The town's residents felt that the Vars, who had played a significant role in founding the town, should have left some of their wealth behind. This situation led to a choice between the Vars and the survival of the town. Desperation pushed the townspeople to confront the Vars. Unfortunately, the Vars had no hoarded supplies to offer, which made the situation even more tragic. The incident was kept secret from the rest of New Barnevelt, and shortly after, the town's inhabitants dispersed, going their separate ways. The fate of Noel, the Vars' son, remains unknown, but it is soon revealed that the Dust Devil was Vars' son. A high-octane battle began between the judges and the Sand Monster, but of course, our man Dread managed to end the menace once and for all. Fall of Dead World Tainted 2016 Keck W and David Kendall followed up their previous work titled Dreams of Dead World with the first installment in a series of stories known as The Fall of Dead World. In the earlier Judge Death Tales, the idea of extinguishing all life on their planet was somewhat glossed over, but Fall of Dead World aimed to prove a more detailed explanation of how it happened and what it was like. By this point in the video, you are likely familiar with the backstory of Judge death, who is from a parallel dimension where life holds a lower value than in our world. Tainted delves into his time as chief judge on Dead World, where he systematically began wiping out life, focusing on a family of struggling farmers dealing with the planet's deteriorating conditions caused by the Dark Judge's influence. Cassandra, a mother, is determined to keep her family intact, which includes her father, John, her grandfather, her daughter, Jess, and her brother. Luke. The grandfather, a bit of a conspiracy theorist, is teaching Jess how to handle a gun, believing that she needs to learn self-defense and that the government is deliberately causing the turmoil. As the population begins to riot, Judge Fairfax escapes the city against the Justice Department orders. He arrives at the family's farm injured and unconscious with his malfunctioning AI-equipped bike. Upon regaining consciousness, he attacks the family and demands their help. Simultaneously, a side judge is tracking him, undergoing a transformation into a dark judge due to the influence of the Sisters of Death. A group of religious zealots, led by Pastor Moses Dodge, comes across the family and begins condemning them, asserting that God despises the living. Uncle Luke is poisoned with a snake. However, Fairfax's bike, known as Bike, outwits the zealots and launches a counterattack that allows the family to escape further judgment. The story now 
shifts between the family's ordeal and the side judge, who explains that Chief Judge Death wants Fairfax brought back alive and had considered him as a potential fourth lieutenant. Another judge, Gates, provides her with the new dead fluids to ingest, enhancing her psychic abilities. She begins identifying herself as Judge Siren, a newly formed dark judge. Judges are compelling people to consume the dead fluid and it's being introduced into the ecosystem. This substance strips away reason, induces extreme violence and is the reason why the judges are determined to eliminate everyone, seemingly oblivious to the fact that Chief Judge Death ultimately intends to kill them too. As chaos escalates, a plague of locusts, likely engineered, further fuels the turmoil. The family we first encountered is desperately trying to reach a doctor to treat Luke, whose poisoning symptoms worsen, leading to delirium. Upon their arrival in the town with the doctor, they are met with a crowd, and John, Cassandra's father, tragically gets shot and killed. The situation becomes worse as all forms of communication and interaction become illegal, and the police start executing people on sight. Luke, poisoned and deranged, begins to attack Cassandra. A member of the local sheriff's department announces their impending doom, but Jess, the last bastion of innocence, shoots him, leading to the death of her own innocence. Grandpa locates the local medical center and seeks help. The doctor opens the door and attempts to administer dead fluid to him, but Grandpa resists, his willpower prevailing. Judge Gates catches up with him on the verge of ending his life when Fairfax arrives and ends Gates with a bullet to the head. However, Gates, saturated with dead fluid, miraculously survives. Another judge, Pierce, holds Fairfax at gunpoint. At another part of the story, Judge Fire, still human but wielding a flaming torch, trains a young recruit. Judge Death contacts him over a video link inquiring about a report. He also communicates with Mortis, the mastermind behind the environmental changes, Fear, who is investigating the resistance, and the sisters, who reveal a prophecy about the judge child standing in the way of death. Cassandra and Jess find themselves in a confrontation with a local law enforcement. Tragically, Cassandra is killed and Jess escapes, swearing vengeance. Meanwhile, Grandpa, standing against the local authorities, managed to save Fairfax from Judge Pierce by delivering a shotgun blast through his chest, his final heroic act before succumbing to death. Pierce and Gates, although severely injured and under the influence of dead fluids, are determined to continue their pursuit. Fairfax resorts to detonating a gas tank in the building, taking them out and escaping outside. Despite being on fire, Pierce persists in trying to eliminate Fairfax, but Jess intervenes and eliminates him with a shotgun blast to the head. Jess and Fairfax later make their escape together on bike, leaving the chaotic and deadly land behind. Home. Home serves as a brief but essential continuation of the Fall of Dead World prequel saga offering a status update on the main characters after the longer cursed. Continuing from where the previous story left off, Sister Siren, Judge Fear, Casey, Gates and their prisoner Judge Fairfax head back to their base. They observe a massive fire ignited by the fire department to repel mutants and resistance fighters, signaling an escalation of chaos. Upon arrival, Siren instructs some judges to take Fairfax to a holding cell, while Casey questions Tucker, who now serves as a host for Judge Fear. Tucker, under Judge Fear's control, asserts his transformation and freezes Casey's hand when she reaches into his mask. It's evident that Tucker, who might be Jess Child's father, is entirely consumed by Judge Fear. Judge Lopez informs Siren that due to a shortage of judges, they've been implanting AI chips into corpses and reanimating them. Dark imagery reveals that they have attached skulls to children's bodies, affixed AI chips and turned them into gruesome hunting dogs. Siren and Casey encounter the sisters of death, Phobia and Nausea, who sense a change in Siren. She resists their inquiries, insisting that she will answer only to the chief judge, as she has captured Fairfax and killed Jess, the judge child. She leaves, warning Casey to steer clear of the sisters. Siren takes Casey to a workshop and instructs him to create terrible things. She makes it clear that he reports to her exclusively. Gates, now a living severed head, inquires about his fate. 
Sauron responds by throwing his head into a vat of acid, briefly letting it burn before retrieving it. Git says that he won't have an easy exit. It's easy to say that Git has been the most problematic character in Fall of Deadworld so far. Siren later finds a moment of solitude, revealing that she resisted the sisters when she spoke to them. She psychically conceals the truth, but she now remembers who she was, Lisa Soren. In the final page of Home, Fairfax is in his cell when his former partner Collins enters. She was briefly mentioned in Tainted in a flashback about Fairfax's wife accusing him of having an affair with Collins. Fairfax is taken aback because he thought Collins was dead. She has been reanimated with a severely broken neck that tilts her head to one side. Colin reveals that this is a gift and Judge Death makes his first proper appearance in the Fall of Dead World series. He welcomes Fairfax, his star pupil and protege, saying welcome home as the story concludes. Marvelous Verdict Does Carl Urban's Dread deserve a sequel? Carl Urban's portrayal of Judge Dread in the 2012 film is one of those movies that divides fans. It was critically well received but panned at the box office. So does that mean the movie does not deserve a sequel? Over the years, the cult following for Dread has continued to grow, breathing new life into the possibility of Dread 2. Box office numbers may not have been impressive, but fan support and the film's enduring popularity have kept the idea of a sequel alive. One reason Dread 2 remains a plausible prospect is the post-release success of the key players. Carl Urban's stardom has risen with roles in films like Thor, Ragnarok, and his leading role in The Boys. Meanwhile, producer and contentious director Alex Garland has garnered acclaim for movies such as Ex Machina and Annihilation. The combination of Urban's and Garland's increased profiles may provide the necessary push to finally greenlight Dread 2. Moreover, their ongoing interest in the franchise has been fueled by the Judge Dread superfiend animated series and the comic book continuation of the movie storyline, despite the initial film's box office letdown. Dread already laid the groundwork for a potentially even better sequel. Although the film was meant to be the first part of a Judge Dread trilogy, the subsequent chapters never materialized. Alex Garland has hinted at the various storylines that could have been explored at those sequels. Dread 2 would have focused on Judge Dredd's origin story and the early days of Mega City 1, with Dread 3 introducing fan favorite villains like Judge Death and the Dark Judges. Garland also contemplated covering the democracy storyline, which delves into the moral complexities of Dredd's authoritarian role in society. But what about you? Do you have the appetite for more Judge Dredd adventures? And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already and have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.